Welcome. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Really not sure how I can follow that, but I'm going to do my best somehow with these 300 slides. I think we'll be able to uh, really fill everybody in in a good way. Um, I'm Tom Chaplin. I'm the chief of police, and it's really my uh, distinct privilege to represent the fine women and men that work for the Walnut Creek Police Department. Um, I would especially like to thank our leadership team because we've uh, We've had a really nice year. We've accomplished a lot, and uh, there's some more good things to come. So uh, with this presentation, I'm going to share with you some of the highlights from 2014. We'll give you an overview of what's going on uh, with criminal activity and uh, let you know what's coming here uh, in 2015. So uh, what did we do last year? We changed our deployment model. Um, we have all of our patrol officers, if they're not assigned to a specialty, essentially working 12 and a half hour shifts. This gave us an opportunity to enhance our overlap and put the most officers out there at the busiest times of day. Also gave us an opportunity to create some new programs, um, including our uh, school resource officer program. Uh, re restructured our sectors and added beats, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. And we also celebrated uh, the centennial along with the city and the community uh, with uh, new badges. So I, I do want to uh, talk about a, a change for us and especially remind the community that uh, one of the things we are striving to do is ensure that we have our officers in neighborhoods and that we are effectively solving crime problems and other quality of life issues. Um, in order to accomplish that, we did create a fourth sector last time. Uh, for those following along, we've had a three sector system for some time. The fourth sector is now essentially our downtown area and our other uh, three sectors, our sector one um, is to the south of downtown all the way out through Rossmore. Sector two is the north of the city going out to our border and sector three essentially runs, covers the valley all the way out to the open space. Um, but we also now divided our three sectors, again not counting downtown, that's its own, into three distinct beats. Um, we did this in a way that our officers could better familiarize themselves with the unique issues that go on in their neighborhood. So um, for anybody that is a, uh, a resident of Walnut Creek, you can go online and you can see exactly where you're at and um, know that we have officers, at least three officers during the course of the week assigned to every beat that are familiar with what's going on and can respond to issues such as uh, traffic complaints or any other crime series or trends that are occurring. Um, just a couple of things we do. If you're ever asking yourself, huh, I wonder what the police department's been up to. Well, here's, here's what it is. You know, we generated over 7,000 reports last year. Um, we arrested over 500 people for warrants, which was up 35%. Um, we actually booked into jail over 1,300 people while we cite and release just under 200. And uh, you can see, all, uh, although our... Adult arrests dropped just a bit. We did arrest more juveniles. Um, I've got the category of proactive contacts listed because one of the things that our department does, in addition to serving our, our primary function of answering and responding to emergency calls for service, we do want our officers out there meeting the community and uh, trying to be proactive in preventing criminal activity. So uh, we had 14,474 of those contacts last year, approximately 12,000 of which were uh, traffic or vehicle stops. Um, in 2010, we adopted an online uh, crime reporting system. This is a way that we think it benefits the community by, by being an easy way that you can report criminal activity online. Um, it is reviewed by a member of our staff. A report number is generated. So if perhaps there was a, a, uh, a minor crime that occurred that you wanted reported, you wanted a report number on, you could do that from the comfort of your own home. And uh, the first year we had 100 of those uh, online reports. This past year we had 538, which was up 38 or 39 percent um, from 2013. One of the other benefits of this is that it leaves our officers out there in the neighborhoods patrolling and problem solving. Um, some major accomplishments I want to talk about. We did uh, promote three sergeants, a lieutenant, and one captain. And uh, we got our patrol staffing uh, full. In fact, um, 
thanks to uh, council's authorization, uh, we were able to overhire. We had uh, permission to overhire by five, but that's actually not easy to do. It's a nice number to have, but we actually reached it this year, and we've really started to enjoy the benefits of having our, uh, our, our uh, department fully staffed. The only place in the department that we are absent uh, where we're still striving to, uh, to fully staff is dispatch, and uh, we're getting there. Um, I think one of the most special things we did in 2014 is the creation of our school resource officer program. Um, we have uh, two officers that are assigned to our high schools. That is their job. Uh, when they report to duty, they go out to their school. Uh, they work with the administration there. They work with the students. Um, they've had an immeasurable impact. We can see calls that they've handled, reports that they've handled. What we can't quantify is the number of uh, leadership moments, mentoring, positive impressions, and the, the impact that they're having on these young people's lives. Uh, very fortunate tonight to have uh, Officer Drew Olson here, um, and he is at Las Lomas. Uh, Officer Raquel Cantillon is out at Northgate. They do a fantastic job, and if you've run into a parent um, from Las Lomas or from Northgate or our schools, and they know that you're a uh, with the city, they're going to thank you for these SROs. They've they've just been fantastic. We also added a third motor officer. I see canine officer Dickey is uh, back there. No dog, probably wants to keep it down in here. Um, and that's been really nice. And we also uh, celebrated the triumphant return of our motor team. So um, I'm going to give you just an overview of some of the other divisions and the things that have been occurring. Um, for our detective bureau, we've had a pretty successful year. We did assign a detective to the Contra Costa County anti-violence support effort, which is really focused on firearm-related violence. And I have heard from the leaders of that team in this uh, collaboration with the Sheriff's Department and the state that, it's, that our detective has been extremely effective, and we've got some good cases coming out of, there, uh, out of this uh, effort with some, uh, some assault rifles and uh, other major weapons being taken off the street. We also worked with DEA on a major uh, pill case involving primarily Xanax. And uh, our detectives uh, worked hand-in-hand -hand on this long-term uh, wiretap case, which ultimately won the uh, HIDA, which is the high-density traffic uh, area, their national award for outstanding prescription drug investigative effort. We've made such an impression on them, by the way. They've been courting uh, our department to send a detective over to uh, work a task force with them, which we're evaluating. Um, a couple other things that occur ongoing that we, we might, we just take for granted, but there's a lot of work involved. Um, we have our uh, detective that works on the Internet tri uh, Crimes Against Children Task Force involved in numerous child sexual exploitation investigations that is l literally preventing further victimization of children. And uh, the fraud cases we've been involved in have uh, have equaled well over uh, losses of well over a million dollars this past year. Um, it's been a great year for the Detective Bureau and uh, a lot of things going on in their shop. So traffic, uh, as you may surmise and have probably talked to me individually about, is uh, one of our issues um, here in town. And we have this year, with our motor team coming back, is uh, revamped and reshaped the traffic team's objectives because with our community policing model and our focus on getting officers into neighborhoods, we have added responsibilities to motors where they're just not on the, the main arteries. But granted, they do uh, definitely police them, as I'm sure many, many people have noticed. Um, but we also work the schools. We get a lot of complaints about safety issues in and around the schools revolve, uh, regarding traffic. Um, the commute issues downtown and with neighborhoods. So what, what commonly occurs is we might hear from a community member that says we've got speeding issues taking place. Is there anything we can do? And we will assign that out to a motor officer or one of the beat officers so that we can put some work into that and measure the problem. Um, and each officer now is assigned a specific sector so they can work with the beat officers to address ongoing traffic concerns. We also have a uh, permanent sergeant set to, to be assigned to our special operations unit um, that will have direct oversight on the traffic team. Um, one, one thing we did last year is when we have uh, reckless driver calls for service, 
which we've spoken about this before, usually comes to the tune of approximately 600 a year. So that's people calling and say, there's a, there's a person weaving in and out of traffic, speeding, or driving in a very unsafe manner. As you can imagine, it takes real serendipity for us to make these contacts because, you know, it's, it's difficult to find them. Sometimes they're out of town right away. But it is an absolute problem, and often it's indicative of uh, dangerous driving behavior. So we implemented a reckless driver letter program. And this is simply a way if somebody sees somebody driving in an unsafe manner, they can call us and say, here's what I saw, here's what the vehicle looked like, and here's the license plate. And what we will do is generate a letter to the registered owner simply to say, um, your car was seen uh, engaged in this behavior. Um, this is just to put you on notice, you know, drive safe. So we fully suspect that there are occasions where perhaps a younger or newer driver is involved in uh, some, some behavior that the parents aren't aware of. We think this will probably help. Um, in one year's time, we generated 297 of those letters. I want to just uh, do a quick overview of some traffic-related statistics. You know, our, our citations rose over 5,000 this past year. Um, which was an increase of 45%. I do want to let you know that although our motor unit came back, that wasn't until uh, late April, early May last year, and we had our fourth member available to, uh, to uh, join the team in the uh, summer. So um, I do attribute the raise um, primarily to the motor team being back out there, but we haven't really seen or felt an entire year yet. Um, fatality collisions, unfortunately, we had one. You'll notice our injury collisions are down 13%. Um, property damage collisions are up um, uh, a, a little bit. Now, you'll, you'll notice in years past, we were in the, uh, the 300s in that area. Uh, several years ago, we stopped responding to property damage-only collisions. And um, it's interesting. I've heard from members of the community that says we'd really like you to do that. I've also heard from members of our staff that say, you know, we don't think this is great. Um, we do want to go out, talk people through this complex and sometimes complicated problem. There are those minor fender benders where you can simply exchange information and everything's hunky-dory. And then there's that are a little more complex. Um, so we do go out to those, and that's one of the reasons you're seeing an increase. If somebody calls and really wants us out there, we'll go out there. Um, so there is a, a number on here that's big, and that is uh, parking citations. And they rose from uh, over 32,000 in 2013 to over 58,000 in 2014. Now, we did, we did change. We added 16 enforcement hours this past year. We also reached uh, full staffing in our uh, police service officer team. I do want to just remind everybody that though 58,000 sounds like a lot, I want to re re remind everybody that there's about 3 million parking transactions a year uh, during that time frame, and that represents maybe uh, just under 2% of the overall transactions. So um, we'll talk more about the, uh, the PSOs as we go forward. We also had a, a small decline in DUI collisions. Um, two other things that I just want to highlight from the traffic team. Uh, we had our uh, pedestrian safety campaign. This was really um, the work of Lieutenant Brian Hill and the motor unit and our special operations unit. And um, it was a 30-day campaign over the holidays. Uh, we had a lot of social media and regular media to get the word out. Um, as part of this, we gave 72 hours of uh, crossing guard and traffic control over the holidays at Mount Diablo and Broadway Plaza and did contact over 500 people. Uh, the other thing you'll see on this slide is that we have joined forces with uh, San Ramon Police Department and the Martinez Police Department, also our partners on the regional SWAT team, to form the Central County Major Accident Investigation Team. We have four motor officers and we have a couple of other officers that really have uh, technical training in uh, traffic collision investigation. Um, and we feel that by teaming with the uh, two other agencies I mentioned is that we can bring additional resources, not only to Walnut Creek, but we can also share in our uh, expertise and training and make sure that we're always in position to properly handle these complex cases. Um, we have helped Martinez out twice on two very unfortunate uh, fatal incidents. 
And um, it's, it's been a successful team. There's one other part of this I want to just let everybody know. On a monthly basis, we do take turns going to each other's community. So uh, the, the other uh, motor officers came to Walnut Creek uh, last month, and we'll do traffic saturation in areas that have been identified as a concern. And that could include responding to complaints from the community or things that we see that obviously need attention. Um, for our canine program, we have three handlers. Uh, they deployed 607 times this past year. Um, and, and there is no question that the presence of canines will, on very critical incidents, keep our officers safe. Um, they generated uh, 44 apprehensions. And in those 607 deployments, we had one apprehension that resulted in a use of force of a bite. Um, it's a very infrequent occasion, um, but I just wanted to share that. They, uh, in addition to actually uh, getting out there and helping us respond to calls for service, they also um, are very active in the community. Uh, we just had some students visit uh, from our, our sister city, or I think that's what we call it, uh, last week. So they're out in Civic Park. And if you've had an opportunity to see them in action, it's pretty amazing what these, uh, what these dogs and what these handlers do. Um, our SWAT team... Um, this, I want to point two things out. I already mentioned that we team with Martinez and San Ramon. And uh, there's two initiatives that we are working on right now. We've uh, been in contact with Con Fire and San Ramon Valley Fire to uh, work towards providing tactical paramedics uh, to our team. So when there is uh, a search warrant service or if we are responding to an emergency in progress or a critical incident, we want uh, EMS embedded uh, with our operators. I can tell you that uh, just under two years ago there was a, an incident in Roseville um, where an officer was shot and this program existed with their SWAT team and they credit it with saving this officer's life. So. Um, obviously, those are tense situations, a lot of training involved. Uh, we've been in contact with chiefs from both departments, and they're very interested. The other part you'll see there is we are working with, uh, with mental health to develop a relationship by which we will have a liaison that can come out to us when we have critical incidents involving somebody that is mentally ill so that we can ensure that in addition to our tactical team, and our crisis negotiation team that we have an expert out there with us to provide guidance and advice. There's a couple things going on with our SWAT. Um, the bomb squad, uh, 27 deployments in 2014. That's down. Our average is generally uh, 50 plus a year. And just a reminder, we are the, the resource for Contra Costa County. Um, we, uh, in October, we're going to be uh, participating in Urban Shield, which is a full-scale uh, pr uh, preparedness exercise. We'll be working with bomb squads from throughout the state. This gives us an opportunity to, to hone our skills. And um, we do want to mention that we have received a, a grant for that iRobot PackBot um, to the tune of 192000 So we now have robots for each part, at least uh, Central County and East. Now, I want to let you know, when we had an expert here to train our, our uh, bomb squad on the use of this robot, the bomb team was able to, via remote control, which really looks like a, an Xbox controller or PlayStation, Atari for some of you in the audience, um, they were able to drive this robot out approximately you know, 70 yards away while inside to a device, which in this case was not a real device, more like a water balloon, at our firing range and shoot that device. Um, it was, it's pretty impressive. It's a great piece of technology, and it's going to be uh, very important in ensuring that our operators are safe when we do go out there. Uh, so I want to talk to you about uh, our support services. We highlighted some of the things going on in patrol, and we highlighted uh, some of the things going on in investigation, some of our specialty units. And it uh, takes a whole team uh, to run this police department and provide exceptional service. And our professional staff from dispatch, our PSO team, uh, our records team, this is a group that uh, keeps us afloat in our admin team. So I want to highlight a couple of things that, have, that uh, they've been involved with, and we'll start with dispatch. 
Um, over 80,000 calls for service or 80,000 calls accepted last year, 43,000 of which were entered as calls for service. Um, just over 21,000 were received on 911. Um, so just because because we like statistics, we wanted to let you know that 97.13% of our 911 calls are answered in less than 10 seconds. Now, I will share with you, there was a time that our dispatch, especially in the wee hours of the morning, would only have one dispatcher um, there. Uh, we have changed that. We've changed that schedule to ensure we always have at least two dispatchers there. Uh, they do great work. We did create two lead positions um, we created them in 2014 and actually staffed them this year. So we have three leads and a supervisor with a 24-7 operation like that. It is a, uh, those are key for us. We added two new dispatchers. We also have an active lateral process, and we have two dispatchers in background. So hopefully we'll have some good news the next time we talk about how we've been fully staffed there for darn near a year. Um, our police service officers, we talked earlier about the uh, parking citations. I want to just remind everybody that they provide such value to the community that is not always seen. 113 child safety seats at the fitting station. Um, they staff our front counter. They assist in a variety of areas, including helping uh, with cold reports, meaning that the crimes occurred, there's no suspect on scene. Um, fingerprinting, toes, crime scene processing, and we're, we're finding ways for them to add value at the schools as well with parking issues. Um, they're also members of our CSI first aid and drive team. You're, you're seeing right now on that slide uh, a picture of some of our PSOs. Uh, you'll notice uh, Juan, a second from the, uh, the right facing, has what is our new look uh, PSO uniform. Sleek, elegant racing stripe. I think you're really going to like it. So uh, the community's got that to look forward to. I don't think we have one in here right now. Um, so the property and evidence, uh, you know, one of uh, the other un unsung areas of the department purged a record uh, 9,200 plus property items in 2014 from cases that were adjudicated, um, including disposing uh, over 100 or 168 guns and just under 700 cases um, with narcotics evidence. Um, we have, a, through a little reorg and reclassification, uh, we are going to have a full-time property and evidence position um, really established in the next two months here. And this is a, a very important time for us. We have to, That's a very complex job uh, that mistakes have huge ramifications. So uh, there's been uh, real great work in there. I really want to uh, thank Joanne. Uh, who I, I think is in here in the back for all her work, so thank you. And, and Shamika's not here as well, and we, we did have an officer assigned there for a while, Dom, and the, the work they did to get to that number was certainly no easy task. Um, so from a technology standpoint, what you're seeing on the, uh, on the screen there on this slide is we're going to be purchasing uh, two kiosks. So we talked earlier about online reporting and the... Uh, over 500 online reports we had this year. We're going to place a kiosk in our lobby, and we're going to place a kiosk at a Ross Moore service office that we opened this year as well. What this is going to do, it's going to allow people to come in, access this kiosk, and um, conduct transactions on there insofar as they'll be able to fill out online reports, really get all the functions you can get from the, uh, from the Internet and visiting our, our, our website. But also we're looking at this with our friends in, uh, in CED Public Works and the rest of the department, or the rest of the city, to see if there's some opportunities to make it more convenient for our customers when they come in here uh, that they could perhaps use this kiosk, accomplish their tasks, and uh, it doesn't always have to be during normal business hours. That's something that will be arriving at a lobby near you very soon. Um, I, I hate to ruin the surprise, but on your consent calendar, you'll see a staff report for uh, replacing all of our mobile data terminals in the vehicle. Um, and we're also, we've had an automated license plate reader system for years. We're looking at uh, upgrading the, uh, our ALPRs, and um, we've tested and are, are looking to purchase uh, new ones from a new vendor. Well, you've probably heard a lot lately about body-worn cameras, and I want you to know that we have tested several um, vendors to find one that will work for us. Um, this is something we started well before there was anything uh, coming from 
terrible news reports that would suggest we should do this. We have felt this is something we needed to examine and the right thing to do for some time. So uh, I think we've uh, landed on a preferred vendor, so you'll probably hear more about that here in the coming months as well. We also launched a social media partnership with Nextdoor.com in which our officers actually, I talked about the beats earlier, um, can communicate with members uh, that live in their beat. So if there is a, a concern going on, and I'll be candid, some of the concerns that go on are, please don't leave your purses in your vehicles or laptops or anything that looks valuable because we have issues with auto burglary. So if there are specific items or, or incidents or issues occurring in a beat, our officers can communicate directly with next door subscribers and, and provide preventative information or, hey, we're looking for this color truck, that type of thing. So it's a really neat level of interaction. Um, this all occurred under the leadership of Jay Hill and a created social media team. And, and I'll tell you, it's a special way that we interact with our community that not many other agencies are doing. Other agencies use Nextdoor. And they do have members of their management team or, or command staff or perhaps one person assigned to use Nextdoor. That's not how we're doing this. We want uh, the people in our community to know who their cops are and to work with us so that we can uh, really do what we can to make living in Walnut Creek the absolute best experience possible. So I'm going to just uh, another special part of our department. You know, we have over 25 volunteers. Uh, they contributed over 2,000 hours in 2014. Um, uh, some of the things they do, they work records, they, they're at our front counter, they work at our Rossmore field office, um, they assist investigations, uh, work community court hearings. Uh, this is one of those programs that makes this department special. And um, I share that for two reasons. A, this is another opportunity to say thank you to those that spend their time with us, um, trying to help us serve the community in a great way. And two, to let people know, we have a volunteer program. If you're sitting at home right now watching this and you're thinking, that police department sounds like a great place to be, A, you're right. B, and if you're interested in volunteering, give us a call. Okay. So uh, a couple of the other volunteer opportunities we have, you see our, uh, our cadet team there on the right. Um, you'll see them at some of our uh, various functions in the community. And uh, these are college students, sometimes high school students, that are volunteering their time and, and really doing some neat things for us and for the community. And uh, we talked about our PSO team earlier. One of our PSOs, our active PSOs, uh, started his career with us as a cadet. And then our RSO program, a reserve service officer, is, uh, is highlighted on the screen as well. This is something we started last year. We have uh, two reserve service officers. Uh, we've had a reserve program for 62 years. Uh, last year, 24 reserves contributed over 7,300 hours. We currently have 26 active reserve officers. Their uh, captain, Chris Flath, I know, is, is here with us tonight. They are involved in a variety of functions. Certainly you see them often at the various special events we have throughout the community. If you go to one of our high school sport events, you'll often see reserves there. Um, they help us in critical incidents and major events. And I, I don't think it would come as a surprise to anybody to say that we have a very active downtown entertainment district. And uh, we are very fortunate to have this cadre of uh, professional reserve officers that are out there assisting us in a variety of ways, providing presence, um, handling other support functions, and transporting uh, prisoners. So let's take a minute now and talk about crime and what's going on in Walnut Creek. Uh, this represents our Part 1 crimes, our UCR part, part 1 crimes, and this is essentially what we share with the FBI each year and that you'll ultimately see in some report probably towards the end of the calendar year. So I'm going to highlight to you on this chart a couple of things that I think are uh, – of interest, um, perhaps troubling, and uh, what represents current trends. Um, you'll see that our robberies decreased uh, from 28 to 23, a 17% uh, difference, a drop. Um, aggravated assaults are up, simple assaults are down. Uh, but what I really want to highlight for you is our residential burglaries were up by 50 total incidents this past year. Uh, we haven't reached the high of 207 that we saw in uh, 2012, but it is up 
35% from one year to the next. Um, while vehicle burglaries, and I alluded to that earlier, are also up 35% uh, or a total of 481 incidents. And I also want to let you know, if you look at our calendar year and how we track, tra track crime, we will usually find upticks occur towards the end of the calendar year. When we hit uh, September through December, you'll see crime trend up. Um, but it generally lands in these areas that we, we expect. Interesting, this year, uh, residential burglaries to date, from this period of January through the end of March, residential burglaries are down 17%. Yet vehicle burglaries right now are up 18% as compa compared to last year, which again was up 35% from the year prior. Um, and one other area that, that is really an issue is with stolen vehicles. Um, we were up uh, quite a few incidents last year from 170 to 221, which represented a 30% increase. Now, I want to let you know that we work together as a region because these, these crime issues, especially with the property crime, we are certainly not the anomaly. This is occurring in other uh, parts of uh, Contra Costa County in the region and perhaps statewide. Um, so uh, that's our, our current situation. For stolen vehicles, we've been working in a collaborative effort on uh, a vehicle theft prevention and apprehension task force that um, the CHP is leading. Uh, their new area commander has been involved in this approach before. So uh, just uh, last week, two of our officers went to Pleasant Hill and looked to recover stolen cars, contact individuals who steal cars, because one of the neat things is we actually know who a lot of these people are. Um, they're on probation for stealing cars, um, sadly, this is not a crime that is uh, being punished very heavily at the moment. So uh, we are trying to collaborate to at least make it uh, difficult to steal cars um, and to catch the people that are doing it. So um, that VSET team will be coming to Walnut Creek in July. Uh, this is our part two crimes. So these are the other crimes or acts that we want to track just to get a sense of what's occurring in the community. And a couple of these things that uh, I think may resonate, you'll see that uh, vandalism events are down uh, just under 300 from 322 the year before, but more importantly, from 492 just four years back. Um, however, weapons offenses uh, have gone up 40%. And make no mistake about it, these are scary calls for our officers. And just on, uh, I think it was Sunday night, one of our officers pulled over a vehicle a um, uh, man and woman in this car and a loaded uh, firearm under the passenger seat and a loaded firearm in the uh, center console. Um, people with felony records, uh, career criminals. This has happened uh, three times in the last two weeks where we've taken guns away from career criminals, and they are here to do no good. Uh, so when we talk about proactive stops, like we mentioned earlier, this is exactly why we make them. Um, also, our narcotics offenses are up 20%. Um, a couple other things of, of interest, you know, the, the drunkenness and disorderly conduct are down. I do believe sometimes our, our officers on those uh, weekend nights help to try to adjudicate just uh, taking somebody to jail by getting them in taxis or other modes of transportation where they're safe. So uh, community policing clearly uh, our, our most important initiative uh, for 2014 and for 2015 and to come. A couple of things to highlight here. We talked about our next door program. Um, we have a crime analyst that will hopefully be joining us here in the next 30 days. Um, we had a uh, competitive process in which we received over 150 applications um, from all over the nation, uh, one from Canada, thus it was an international search. And uh, we have found a, a fantastic professional in this field that's going to really, really be impressive. With that, we're going to seek to, in 2015, find a way to create a community crime report that we can share so people know what the trends and series are so that they can better protect themselves. Um, we've had our uh, neighborhood watch program in existence for a long time. Uh, we also sent that out via Nextdoor recently, that announcement. Uh, I know that Sergeant David Rangel is in the audience, and um, he is our expert in this area and has offered himself up 
um, to anybody in the department that's going to a meeting to really talk about what the goals are and what we want to do. Um, that we can't be everywhere all the time. We have 78 police officers for a town with uh, you know, about 64,000 people. Um, and what we need is people to be alert, be vigilant, call us when they th see something suspicious, and never shy away from calling us if you see something suspicious. Don't assume we have something better to do. Um, if we do, that's okay, but we're going to get out there, and you never know what crime you're solving. So um, Neighborhood Watch program, hugely uh, important for us. Um, our collaborative efforts have been pretty uh, special this year. I, want, I just want to highlight two areas of collaboration. One's with the uh, homelessness in Walnut Creek. And we uh, began working last year with uh, various stakeholders to say, listen, we're having some negative um, issues occurring in the downtown area and some other neighborhoods. And what we want to do is we don't obviously can't arrest our way out of a problem. Um, what we want to do is find a way to deal with the negative secondary side impacts of uh, some of the people in our community in a way that is firm, stops the problem, but also compassionate and uh, treating people with dignity. And uh, how we've done this is uh, we've worked, especially with the Trinity Center, to find ways to find uh, uh, beds for people. Um, we've worked with our officers, um, with our businesses. We've worked on encampment issues. And uh, we've worked, one, th one major thing that we've seen, and, it, and it's been very advantageous, is for a long while, um, the uh, people were being fed in Civic Park. Homeless were being fed in Civic Park, and that, that is certainly a, a noble endeavor. The problem we were having is that then there were some criminal acts or other uh, quality of life issues that were being impacted as a result. So one of the things we did was we got together with the Trinity Center and Hillside Covenant Church to say, listen, we, we certainly support this, but perhaps we can <clears throat> have it move to the Trinity House so people aren't afraid to bring their kids to our playground or um, you know, have, have any lessened use of Civic Park. That's one example of a collaborative that we've uh, engaged in this past year. Another one is our policing in Rossmore. We we got a variety of uh, personnel from our department, from uh, literally every different work group, uh, to talk about what can we do in Rossmore that would be a great way to help people feel safe and secure. And we got together after listening to Rossmore and identified several areas that needed our uh, immediate attention. Um, and we did our best to ensure that we were there. And what I've explained to some people is, you know, depending on where you live, you might have more likelihood of seeing a deer than you will an officer, but we're there. In fact, we created a, a card, a, a reader system, the RFID, that uh, Sergeant Mike Segru, who's with us tonight, um, worked. He's, he's the, uh, leads this program. This, this would actually let us know how often our police are going into Rossmore. We went over 1,200 times last year, um, but people don't see that. Uh, they, they might more now. Um, we did a couple other things. We, we generated and submitted a monthly article on um, timely and relevant issues to the Rossmore Times, including uh, fraud, elder abuse, uh, traffic topics. Uh, we conducted a presentation on fraud prevention that uh, Assemblywoman Bocan Buchanan um, was at. I think uh, Detective Kohlmeister, I don't know if she's in the, in the crowd. Yeah, yeah, she is back there. Um, has been pivotal in doing work with the uh, fraud issues in Rossmore. And these, these actually are prevalent, not just in Rossmore, but, you know, if somebody ever calls you up and asks for money, don't give it to them. That, that's our simple answer to that. Anyway, um, but this happens quite often in Rossmore. Um, we also started a monthly Coffee with a Cop program. So we will show up every third Thursday from about uh, 10 to 11.30, um, grab coffee, because that's part of this, and uh, sit down and just spend some time in Rossmore and answer questions. So it doesn't have to be a specific call for service, but we'll just spend time there and talk about what the issues are. And I can tell you that the single most prevalent issue is traffic. Um, we hear it from everybody. So we did something about it. You'll notice that when we, we wrote 15 citations in Rossmore in 2013, and we wrote 243 in 2014, and a, a small increase of 1,520%. Uh, um, but also because of our presence 
And um, because of some nice working relationships that we've developed in Rossmore, we have explained to residents, you know what, if there's criminal activity, you call us. And then you can let Securitas know. We'll work together. They're your eyes and ears, but we come out and handle crime issues. So um, things have gone very well, and it's it's a, a microcosm of an entire effort to get out of the community and solve long-term problems. I, I got to tell you, I feel guilty even drinking water. <laughs> I took a small sip. So... Um, I want to close with the last last couple of slides. I just want to talk about some challenges ahead and what you what you can expect from us in 2015. Uh, Proposition 47 was a a, a real big change, um, uh, voter approved and enacted at uh, midnight that night. There were several crimes that used to be felonies that are now not, um, and uh, I'll give you an example of a couple. It uh, used to be if we arrested somebody for possession of heroin or cocaine or methamphetamine, um, we would take them to jail because that was a felony. Uh, that is now a misdemeanor that can be cited, uh, the subject can be cited out. Um, possession of date rape drugs, formerly a felony, now a misdemeanor. I'm going to give you my candid and what I think is an expert opinion on that matter. That's a joke. There is absolutely no reason to possess those drugs. There are several items of cleanup language that are taking place uh, at the legislative level to fix some of these things, but Proposition 47 has sadly uh, provided, taken away some of the disincentives that used to uh, be in place to prevent criminal activity. And sadly, I think we're starting to see some of the, the negative and, and perhaps unintended consequences of that bill in that our property crime is rising. And um, there's not a lot of great solutions other than us just always striving to identify the, uh, the culprits and uh, holding them accountable. But it is, it is an issue. Uh, realignment's been around for a while now. And what's interesting is we... we often refer to this offender population as AB109ers. And this basically just transferred the duty to supervise people that had been convicted of nonviolent, non-sex, non-serious felonies to really community supervision. So it was just a bit of a change. Now, in Walnut Creek, we right now have two AB109 offenders. It's a very small group. Um, I think last year we might have hit 10. Uh, but that doesn't speak to other offenders that, uh, that are in other areas that perhaps come to our community and sometimes uh, get involved in, in criminal activity. Um, our offender population, uh, it's always a challenge. We monitor who comes in and out of the community. But as we learned in the past two months, we don't have usually a lot of say on who comes in here, and we'll find out often. We have 30 registered uh, sex offenders in Walnut Creek right now. Um, we know where they are and who they are, but the sex offender placement is clearly an issue uh, for our community with the recent placement of an individual in unincorporated Walnut Creek, but certainly in a position to impact Walnut Creek. And there is a, there's a lot of activity that's occurring right now um, with the city attorney's office, the district attorney's office, and clearly the police department. So I think we'll have more to report on that later. And I talked about property crime earlier. So some of the things that are coming up right away in 2015, um, we have a lateral officer process. Even though we reached that magical moment where we were overhired, um, people have elected to retire. And uh, so we've started a process. Uh, we're, we're looking initially at laterals. And then as we hit the end of the year in January, we'll probably start an entry-level process. Just a reminder, that takes about one year from hiring to get through an academy to hopefully pass a field training officer program and actually go out alone in a car and, and, and help us out. Um, we'll have a couple promotions. Uh, we'll promote a captain. Uh, we'll promote uh, one to three lieutenants and three to five sergeants. Now, um, I do want to take this moment. I mentioned earlier how uh, uh, thankful I am and really 
privilege to work with such a fantastic leadership team. And I, I especially want to uh, highlight the great work that uh, Captain Steve Skinner and Captain Mark Perledi have provided uh, this past year. Uh, with a lot of changes, you have to have exceptional leadership, and they have certainly answered the bell. Um, I do want to let everybody know as well that uh, if Mark Perledi is here next year, uh, it will be as a member of the community. Um, enjoying a riveting presentation, but uh, after an incredibly distinguished law enforcement career, um, he's going to be retiring here in the next uh, couple of weeks. I have uh, goaded him into staying on with us through the summer to help us train up his uh, replacement. So um, I just did want to say uh, thank you, Mark, for all you did for the department, for the community. You made a difference. We should clap. So um, a couple other things. Uh, you've probably heard me talk about crime reduction model uh, before. That happens this year. Uh, crime analysts is really pivotal in making this occur. This is essentially, essentially going to be a way that our department can get together, um, really take a look at criminal activity, where it's occurring, who's doing it, why it's happening, and then working in a very strategic way to uh, stop it. Um, we have, as part of our deployment model, also generated a, a special enforcement team that will have one sergeant, the same sergeant I mentioned earlier that's also going to oversee a K-9 and motors, um, and three officers that are going to be out working in a variety of ways addressing crime issues um, and other quality of life issues. So if we have upticks in a vehicle burglary in a certain beat, we can get these officers out there responding to that crime. They're going to be focusing on some of our most uh, uh, dangerous offenders and um, really targeting uh, some areas where um, we're having activity that's unacceptable to our community. Um, we're also starting to have what we're calling POP projects or problem-oriented policing. And this is essentially a way to identify an issue that's occurring, work together to identify the problem, figure out really why it's happening, develop a response to it, and then work to curtail the problems in a way that we can measure the success and create really blueprints for how to handle similar problems in the future. And we, as a management team, engaged in kind of a, a problem-solving exercise to uh, highlight how a, a POT program can work, and we identified a couple of things currently occurring in the community. And one of the things we talked about was we have had an increase in shoplifting cases at Target in which the suspects are drug addicts that are coming on BART from San Francisco and stealing items of value from Target. So I like, Mom, I wonder how often that's happening, once or twice? This was happening almost daily. So with this POP project, and again, we started as an exercise. We said, what can we do to curtail this problem? Because there's got to be a reason to. Uh, crime is all about access and opportunity. And I'm fairly certain there's other stores in between us and San Francisco that people can steal from. Certainly not that I'm advocating that. There's got to be a reason, however, that people are coming here. So um, in our efforts here to, uh, to talk about when and how and why this is occurring, we actually created a POT project and have spent some time working with BART, watching people coming to and from the, uh, the um, BART to the Target that are, are perhaps known um, shoplifters, working with Target to see what we can to, uh, to drive down that instance. Y you figure if there was 10 instances... Uh, a week or, or every two weeks, and we were able to stop those. Again, that frees up time so we can get out there and do our job in the neighborhoods. Um, we talked about the crime analysts as well. I look forward to introducing our crime analysts to you in the near future. Um, I want to close by talking about what's occurring right now. I'd be remiss if I didn't take a moment to talk about the state of the industry. And um, you can't turn on the news on any given night without seeing some instance where a law enforcement member has conducted an act that looks very bad. I want to tell you that when there are those incidents or issues that occur, it hurts us because though it's not us, it is the industry. So we have to own that as well. And I want to let you know that um, we address this in a variety of ways. We talk about what's going on. We talk about acceptable behavior 
and uh, how community trust and confidence is a tenuous thing. You've got to earn it and you've got to maintain it. And we strive every day to do so. We, we strive in a variety of ways by, by running this police department in a very transparent way, by being in the community, um, by sharing what we're doing. Um, when those incidents occur, we talk about them and um, we also are addressing issues on the regional level. Our chiefs group gets together and talks about them. I want to share with you as well that at the state level, um, I am a board of director for the California Police Chiefs Association and on their legislative committee. We do monitor laws that can assist and inform and, and help law enforcement be better. Um, but there are two, uh, two key phrases that go hand in hand with this discussion, and that is procedural justice, and that is police legitimacy. And really, police legitimacy, um, in short, measures the way the community feels about and reacts to the police. And uh, trust us in what we're doing is to really ensure a safe community and treating people fairly well. Uh, procedural justice has a bit more facets to it, but at the, at the end of the day, people need to know and should expect from us when we contact somebody, it's got nothing to do with the color of their skin, uh, with their gender, uh, with any other affiliations. We respond to issues in the community. People need to have a voice when they deal with their police department. They need to be able to tell us their side of the story, and they need to expect from us that we are fair, that we are impartial, and that we don't believe that crime reduction provides any kind of impetus to ever sacrifice those areas. It's a key moment in law enforcement. I will tell you this. I have every trust and confidence in the women and men of this department. They are fine people. They engage in acts ranging from daily acts of kindness to a phone call I just got in which a community member commended our hero on uh, helping a duck and her ducklings across the street to recovering, uh, helping to recover uh, rabbits or bunnies that were recently stolen from the elementary school and returned safely, uh, to stopping known felons and taking car uh, guns out of their car. From courageous acts to kind acts, we have a fantastic group here, and I want our community to know, and I want you to know, and everybody here to know, if there is ever an instance where you think we are not meeting our obligation, I want you to call me directly, and we'll talk about it, and we'll fix it. Um, I did not want this moment to pass without um, talking about this issue and letting you know we are as troubled, if perhaps not more so, than much of what we're seeing. So um, let me then go to the last slide, which is questions. Pretty, pretty fancy. I did that. Um, what, what might I be able to uh, answer for you tonight? Okay. Chief and Chaplain, thank you very much for what is really a very interesting and informative and a very comprehensive report on the police department. And I will thank you and uh, looking to you, thank all the men and women of our police department for everything they do every single day of the week to keep us safe, to keep our community safe. And I, I also just want to thank you for addressing the last topic of community confidence. And I, from people I talk with and listen to in and around the community, I think if you were to do a survey within the community, you would find that at, the, at least at the present not time, but for some time in the past as well, there's a very high level of confidence and trust in our police department. I think coming out and being transparent like this and some of the other things that you're doing that are that the police department is doing that are very innovative, that are looking to how we keep our community safe, really contribute to that as well as do the high standards that you apply to the people that come to the police department to work. So I thank you for all of that. With that, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Council Member Silva, you get the first one. Well, I will echo the mayor's um, comments and thank all of you who are here this evening. It's a real testament to your leadership um, Chief Chaplin, and also to the department that so many of the members of your department are here tonight and the quality of the work that they do. So thank you. Thank you, all of you. And I know there's a big challenge, and I'm glad you addressed it, related to AB 109, the realignment, and also to Proposition 47. And I assume there's a corollary between, at least in your mind, um, between those two legislative actions and 
the rise in property crime, narcotics instances, and weapons charges, but I don't want to assume anything. Is that what you were saying to us? In my opinion, I do think that we have uh, additional property crime based on offender population that we did not have before. And um, again, with uh, some of these former felony offenses, the people that are breaking into cars that are uh, taking advantage of an open garage to go steal a bike or breaking into homes, this is not a large segment of our community by any stretch of the imagination. It's a small amount of offenders. And the best thing we can do to remove those offenders is by working diligently to identify them and then holding, to them, holding them to account via successful prosecutions. If you can no longer send uh, career criminals to prison or even sometimes to jail, they are back out committing the same crime. So I think the, the disincentive to, to commit crime um, is exacerbating our, our existing problem. Now, what's interesting, we talked about those statistics, especially the auto burglaries. Um, we have a shift report that's generated daily that shows significant incidents that occur throughout the uh, community so that every member of our department knows what's going on and where it's occurring. And there's not a day that there's not an auto burglary, if not four or five, that are occurring on those shift reports. Um, since we've hit about that time frame, um, they've been going up. And the fact that th so far this year, after rising 35% uh, in 2014, the fact that this time where our property crimes generally don't start trending up, that we're up 17% is troubling. So I do think that's got something to do with it. The tougher thing to quantify is the uh, AB 109 and realignment. And I'll tell you, the biggest issue we've had is at the state levels because no one can agree on what recidivism actually means. Um, so that's made measuring this very difficult. Uh, I am sure there's people especially involved in, in realignment and uh, you know reducing prison population that can probably infer from statistics that this is a great success. To my way of thinking, if somebody's arrested for residential burglary and comes out and commits any crime in our community that they would not have been there to commit before, that to me is an act of recidivism, but the, the technical description I don't think exactly measures what's occurring. So with these two new offender populations and really the sea change that we've seen um, in the past five, six years, I do think we are starting to see some issues related to that for our community primarily in property crime. Our violent crime level is very low. It's an extremely safe community to be in, but I, I do think there are some, uh, some negative consequences for us. I appreciated you um, ref talking about the body camera issue. Another issue that we hear about is the purchase that different local police departments are able to do of what I would call residual military equipment. If I may not be using the correct term. Are we looking at anything like that, and what concerns would you have about it? You know, there's, there's a lot of uh, studies and discussion recently on what is the 1033 program, which is essentially a program by which a military can provide surplus or still good equipment to uh, law enforcement agencies. Um, some of these manifest themselves in a Humvee showing up in somebody's community. Um, we don't need a Humvee. Uh, we certainly don't need a, a helicopter, but some, some agencies have. Um, so uh, we have no immediate desire or interest to procure anything of a major level. I will say this, though. There could be opportunities where equipment is made available that would have a, a value to us. And I will speak specifically in the area um, of a Bearcat or a vehicle that our bomb team could use to uh, safely deliver or remove personnel. So I am following on the legislative front and at the statewide level some of the implications. We have no desire to turn the Walnut Creek Police Department into a, a small military outfit. Um, but, but I am familiar with the issues involved. Thank you. Okay, Councilmember Waddell, Councilmember Carlston. Uh, yes, Chief, I don't, I don't really have any questions. I just simply want to make a, a few comments. 
I, I want to compliment you and the presentation. I'd like to compliment the leadership staff and the leadership you've provided. Uh, I want to uh, express appreciation to all the various police officers and all the support personnel that, that work. We have a very safe city, and it's because of the good job that you do. I want to highlight a couple of things. One is the volunteers. I think that speaks highly of not only the police department, but the residents of the city of Walnut Creek, that so many would volunteer their time and that you would take the time to, to work with and train them. And I'd like to also highlight the, uh, the efforts you're making with respect to the youth, being in the schools, being at uh, various functions and so forth. Uh, I think that's excellent. I think what was recently done at Las Lomas uh, was an outstanding illustration of the, uh, the service that were provided by your department. We want to thank you for that and thank all the officers here and those that aren't here. Thank you, sir. Chief, I actually have a question for you that I don't recall you talking about, and yet it's the use of drones. I, 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 as you have been evaluating body camera, I'm sure you've been thinking about that, and it's been in the media, and it's in the legislature as well. What, what are your thoughts on that? There's a lot of, uh, lot of discussion about the use of drones right now, and um, I know that some agencies do have drones and use them. Um, I was asked this question by a community member over the weekend at a soccer game. Um, what could the positive implications be? And, uh, you know, if we had a missing child in the open space or if we had a uh, situation where we were going to serve a search warrant um, and potentially had a violent individual inside, you could see how that resource might be handy. Um, I will say this. Um, I have zero inclination, nor does the department, to move forward um, to purchase a drone or implement a, a program until a couple of questions are answered. And those are being handled right now at the legislative level. Um, there are times when uh, airports, they won't land a plane if there's a drone in the area. So there's a lot of th implications with the FAA. I wouldn't say that it's an absolutely, uh, you know, uh, that, that we shouldn't consider it in the future. Um, if we were to consider it, however, I would say we had um, a discussion with the community, talked about its uses, and had people feel comfortable that we certainly don't want to violate anybody's privacy rights. Thank you very much, and thank you again for everything that you do for our community and for the presentation tonight. I think it's going to be seen a, a lot by many people who are interested in, in the things that you do, so thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. If I could also just add, I, I do want to thank uh, my colleagues on the executive team that uh, we work very well together. Um, my boss, uh, Ken Nordoff, and I want to thank you really for the great support you've given us and helping us really accomplish a lot in these last two years. Thank you very much. The the next item on our agenda is a proclamation on uh, Bike to Work Month. And will our Transportation Commissioner, Ken Strongman, join me at the podium? <laughs> 